Thank you. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our final speaker of the morning session, my dear friend, the longtime board member of the Drug Policy Alliance, the senior servant at Metropolitan Interdenominational Church in Nashville, Tennessee, Reverend Edwin Sanders. Ed. I want you to stand back to your feet. All those freedom movements that Ethan just listed, every one of them has a freedom song. So I'm going to treat you, treat you one today, okay? I'm just going to start singing it. Some of you know it, and most of you that don't know it, I'm just going to ask you to learn it real quick. It just goes like this. We who believe in freedom cannot rest, cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. That's it. That's all of it. We who believe in freedom cannot rest, cannot rest. There you go. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Come on, louder than that. We who believe in freedom cannot rest, cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Now take the roof off this time. We who believe in freedom cannot rest, cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Ethan talked about freedom. But freedom is a constant struggle. Freedom is not what we do on our day off. Freedom is not the business that we're about when it's convenient and easy. Freedom is not something that we can opt into and opt out of. Freedom is not something that we can excuse ourselves from when we desire. If we're gonna be a part of this movement, there's a way in which we have to understand that we cannot rest until it comes. On July, August the 12th, Ethan sent me an email. And the first line of the email was, what a day, if only every Monday was like this. I've held on to that ever since, because we need to be the people who can stand up every day and say, what a day. We need to be able to know that every day is the right day. It's not just the day when we've heard from Washington the news that we want and need to hear. It's not just the day when we've been able to have the experiences that allow us to have some sense of individual and collective success in our efforts. It's not just the day when we personally feel like something we've done has made a difference, but it's the day that has to become our every day. Ethan said he wishes every Monday could be that way. I want every day to be that way because there's a way in which we ought to be able to say every day, it's all right. It's all right. Now I want you to have that line. I'm used to talking to people who talk back to me, all right? <laughs> If you don't want to talk back, you ain't got to say amen, but nod, wink, or do something that lets me know you hear me, right? And I think the first thing I want to say about this business about it's all right, and that's the line I want you to hold on to today, is just simply, it's all right. Let me hear you say that. It's all right. You see, it's all right today because we're the right people, and we're in the right place. I've been, it's all right. All right. We're the right people in the right place. It's the right day, it's the right issue, and if we allow ourselves to live up to the possibilities and the potential that are locked up the people in this room, we can be sure that the drug war will be brought to an end. So I realized I was going to end up with only about 15 or 20 minutes. So I decided what I was going to do was give you the title of all five of the messages I intended to deliver. <laughs> the first one was, don't take no for an answer. <laughs> Is that all right? <laughs> the second one was, don't turn back. <laughs> the third one was, overcoming the culture of oppression. <laughs> the fourth one was, living in the shadows of the empire. And the fifth one is one that many of you all know, especially if you're a reggae fan, if you know any Grant's voice at all, is living on 
the front line. Let me tell you what I heard in our session yesterday when we brought faith leaders together. One of the things that we talked about in that session was we talked about the whole business of how this movement has evolved in the places that we're celebrating here today. And one of the things I want to suggest to you is that movements don't happen unless there's something, unless there's some energy, unless there's some force, unless there's some dynamic, unless there's some presence, unless there's something that transcends what we can easily reduce to what we can embrace with our limited ability to logically and reasonably wrap our minds around it. The first thing I'm convinced we have to understand is that it's beyond the limitations of reason and logic. But what we're talking about in this movement requires you being able to see, being able to believe, being able to embrace, being able to visualize, being able to somehow carry in your heart the awareness that what you're trying to do, even though all of the, all the factors in life might say it's beyond what can be done, you have to be the one that believes there's something bigger and there's something greater and there's something that you can do that no one else can see and seem as being impossible. When Ethan stands here and talks about the movement that transcended into the end of slavery, don't you know that no one who had shackles on their feet, who had, had the whip marks on their back, who did not have any of the privileges that were a part of the ideals of this country, could even begin to see the possibility that we would be here today? You see, it's only because there's a spirit that carried it. What we talked about a little bit yesterday was trying to talk about how we own, how we shape, how we fashion, how we end up being a part of constructing the spirit of this movement. And I'm convinced it's captured in that little song I had you singing. that just simply said, we who believe in freedom will not rest until it comes. Don't you know there were those who could never believe that women's rights would be where they are today? Don't you know that just 30 or 40 years ago, there are those who never would have believed the same gender-loving people would be able to freely marry and have relationships that are accepted and affirmed and celebrated in places where you never thought there would be before? Don't you know that there's no way that the rights that we take for granted are not the byproduct of some people who had to rise above the limitations of logic? And we need to understand that from where we are today. Because this movement is one that's going to have a transforming effect upon the world and the times in which we live. Ethan has said it, but you need to hear it in your own heart, in your own voice, in your own way. You need to understand if we do this right, we'll deal with all the complex and difficult issues that are undermining the infinite possibilities of life that are available for all of us in this world. If we do this right, we'll address the issues of economic opportunity. If we do this right, we will deal with the issues of access to housing and that kind of thing. If we do this right, we will deal with health care that's available to everywhere, everybody everywhere. If we do this right... You see, there's a thread in this. There's a way in which I cannot be happy. I cannot be content. I cannot be satisfied. I cannot sit down. I can't stop until I know that the forces that drive and the forces that continue to be a part of what allows this horror to be visited upon us in the name of the drug war is not going to go away. Don't you know the drug war, I want you to understand this right now, is nothing but the mask of all the stuff we hate. The drug war is the mask of racism. The drug war is the mask of sexism. The drug war is the mask of xenophobia. The drug war is the mask of homophobia, Islamophobia, and all the other stuff that continues. It's the mask. And one of the things that we're going to do is take off the mask. I'm almost ashamed to tell you this. I don't know why. Now, Ethan, I depend on Ethan to feed me information. That's my wife right there, Billy. Y'all, wave me your hand, Billy. Let me tell you what Billy says about me all the time. She says that she'll be able to say this about Ethan's speech this morning. She says, I can be with you where you heard something the same time I heard it for the first time. And the next time I hear you deliver the speech, I would swear you were it all originated with you. Now, I depend on Ethan all the time to feed me information. But yesterday, we started talking about the Netherlands and the way in which that country had made one of the more important steps historically in terms of dealing with this issue of drugs and rights. And the line that I picked up on Ethan, which you never gave me before, was evidently what undergirded that in the Netherlands was this line that 
all people are of worth. Well, all people are worth saving. Is that the line? All people are worth saving. Can you imagine what that means? All people are worth saving. You see, what that means is that that gave a, that gave a voice to a spirit. Uh, that gave a voice to a power. That gave a voice to something that transcends all the limitations and all the barriers of fragmentation and division. Because there's a way in which what we have to do at the heart, at the core, at the center of this movement is make sure that all of our efforts are shaped in a fashion that are affirming of all people. I like the way it was said a little bit earlier. It's ending the war on people who use drugs. Ending the war on people who use drugs. It's kind of like going to the doctor. I tell people all the time, you always want to go to a doctor who treats the person who has a disease versus the doctor who treats the disease that the person has. That might not sound like it's a big difference. But the difference is, it's about people. It's not just about individuals. It's about community. It's about understanding that there's something inherent, that there's something that's a part of who we are as human beings that's always mitigating in the direction of trying to bring together, pull together, keep together, hold together the community of people that some people, like Martin Luther King Jr., referred to as the beloved community. But there was a community that had a heart in a way that allowed, as Howard Thurman said, when we engage each other, my relationship to you is when my heart connects with your heart. When my heart and your heart begin to resonate as one, when my heart and your heart come to be a part of a fabric that is seamless and cannot easily be torn apart because we've been woven into that which we are as a result of a spirit that's bigger than all of us. Ethan, your daddy would have been proud of you this morning. That boy prayed, didn't he? in front of everybody. <laughs> you know, Ethan's father was a rabbi. He was a rabbi. He learned it well. He heard it enough, and he knew it. I always like it about Ethan, too, because he always understands why I have to call up at the last minute and say, Ethan, got to do a funeral, got to do a wedding, got to do this and another. But, you know, let me just tell you this. It is about people who understand that you not only have to, have to just give lip service, to the ways in which you believe and know and understand there are some energies, there are some forces, there are some powers working that are bigger than we are. But there's a way in which we have to appreciate the fact that we are the evidence of that fabric right now. We are the drug policy congregation. We are the drug policy assembly. We are the people who right now represent what is the greatest hope to ending the insanity and the madness that is loose all around us. So, we can't ever take no for an answer. We can't take no for an answer. We have to be the ones who will insist on being heard. We can't take no for an answer. And if you're not going to take no for an answer, the first thing you have to do, you have to move beyond your fear. And that's still fear. That continues to be the thing that cripples and undermines and represents a stumbling block in terms of this movement. There are too many people in Congress. I was so glad to hear the congressman suggest that perhaps there are some ways in which we will see some changes because of the way in which this groundswell of energy, which we represent in this room, is going to impact the behavior of a lot of folks in Washington who, even if they get on board for the wrong reason, you know, let, let me tell you something about a strong voice, okay? A strong voice will make bad people do the right thing. That's right. You need to understand that. You know, there's a, there's a great text, a, a great biblical text, and I always, uh, but it doesn't make any difference. You don't have to read the Bible, you don't know the text either. But it's a great story about a woman who said she had to go to a judge who had uh, no fear of God and no respect for people, but it said she just kept on coming. And eventually, the wall came down. The barrier was removed. The avenue was open, and the possibilities were released. We're the ones that have to understand we've got a long way to go. But a part of what we have to do is we can't take no for an answer. But we have to make sure that our critique is relentless, such that when you heard that title I gave you called the, the whole business of living in the shadow of the empire, it is great for us to be here where we are today. It is a wonderful moment of affirmation of the energy and the effort that has gone forth in terms of this movement. But you have to appreciate the fact that even right now, we are living in the shadow 
of the empire. Right now, it's obviously not in the interests of those who see themselves in this world as the true power elite to be a part of this movement. But we have to understand that if we continue to raise the issues as we should, if we continue to insist on not accepting no for an answer, there's a way in which those who in some ways we think can never be moved, bad people, <laughs> bad people, can be moved and forced to do the right thing. There are people who are profiting. There are people who are getting funky rich every day, <laughs> every day, off of continuing to perpetuate this madness. But we need to understand, and they need to understand, that we are not those who will try to pretend that the issue of the power being vested in the hands of just a few is not a part of what continues to perpetuate the problem. We're talking about freedom. We're talking about freedom, and we have to be clear about what it means. But last but not least, we have to understand what it means to be those who are living on the front line. The people who live on the front line, the first thing you got to know is you got to be ready to live under fire. It's, you got to be ready to live under fire because there are people who are taking aim and there are people who are trying to undermine. There are people who are not our friends who are about the business of trying to make sure that this movement does not go forward. I couldn't help but appreciate Ethan's words when he said, there's a way in which we have to look at those of you that have began to bring down some of the barriers and understand that we've got to figure out how to support you, encourage you, and stand with you because you're going to be living under fire. You're living on the front line. The first thing you have to, second thing you have to realize is that where you are is simply at the point that there are literally tens and hundreds of thousands who are in the ranks behind you who need us to continue to speak up, speak out, and if necessary, act up until that which we need is addressed and done. The third thing we have to do is we have to live in the way that for us says we will live in the light. You know, it's important not to allow ourselves to become in any way closeted, any way Let me just tell you, five minutes? I was... <laughs> Actually, I was going to stop in about two. That's all right. So I got three more minutes to work with, all right? But you have to get ready for this. You got to be able to live in the light every day. Uh, it's not easy. We're talking about bringing the faith community into this arena. And for us to speak the truth, that needs to be and has to be spoken around this issue. And I should not say bring into this. The faith community has always been here and involved. But we're talking about a massive involvement in a way that we have not seen before, especially in the communities of those who are being disproportionately impacted more than others. We are blessed that we've now been able to create an alliance and a relationship with the Sam Proctor Institute and the work that they're doing. We're blessed in that the folks from PICO, who've always been there on social justice issues, have been there. Uh, we need to appreciate the fact that uh, we do have an opportunity in the next few months, I'm convinced, to be a part of doing something that might see for us, Ethan, a greater return on the promises that were made in this last electoral season when the president won his second term. We need to be figuring out right now how to make sure that the midterm elections come out in a way that give the kind of, let me tell you the reason why I have hope in that. I have hope in it because we're talking about a president who spent more than the last two decades, almost three decades of his life, organizing people around social justice issues in the south side of Chicago. Now we gotta figure out how we bring that energy to bear with the presence in the White House. And when that happens, we're going to all know that we did the right thing in terms of our support and in terms of our, but that's only going to happen when we continue to be the ones who push the issues, stand up, speak up, and necessarily act up. 
And the last thing I want to tell you is that you got to learn what it means to just keep the faith. Now, for some of y'all, that instantly takes you to a place of difficulty. Because some of you all have been alienated from the institutions uh, that you think of as being identified with faith. But what I want to suggest to you is that it's bigger than any religion in and of itself. It has to do with something that's inherent in us all. And that's the ability to believe in what you've heard me say now for the fourth time, the infinite possibilities of life. That's the only way you can believe in every person being a person that has worth. It's the only way you can believe. And what I'm saying to you today is that you have to keep the faith. Because you see, when you're on the front line and when you're under fire, you've got to be able to know that there is a power greater than you. That there is something that is a part and akin to the truth that we've been trying to deliver through this movement for a number of years now. And we have to be the ones who will stand in it, stand for it, and not let it go. We have to be the ones who are the champions of the disenfranchised, the marginalized, the left out, the forgotten, the put down, the held down, the kept down, the misused, the abused. We are the ones that have to be there every time a voice needs to be heard on behalf of those who are struggling every day to overcome the ways in which the ravages and the powers of this drug war have served to undermine the lives of so many. It happens when people like you and me and all of us stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. And speak up in the face of what might be a horror that's unfolding. We're the ones that know in spite of everything, it's what? It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right because we are the ones that are going to stand up. It's going to be all right because we are the ones that are going to speak up. It's going to be all right because we are the ones that won't turn back. We who believe in freedom cannot rest, cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. We who believe in freedom cannot rest, cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. One more loud time. We who believe in freedom cannot rest, cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. God bless you.